Look who we run into. We happen to run into interesting people everywhere we go here. One of which is Jason Beardsley. Jason, how you doing here? Hey, I'm doing great, Pete. How are you this morning? I'm doing well. You know, Jason and I met, I don't know, what was it, a year ago a year or ago. so? Yes. So Jason lives in Ohio. He is one of these guys that he's done so much in the military, he can't really tell you what he's done or where he's gone or who he's fought beside or the enemies he's taken on. Uh, but we've been so honored to have Jason on board with us as a senior advisor at Concerned Veterans for America. Uh, Jason, give us a little bit of, an, uh, of a sense of your military background. Sure. Uh, and then why you're involved uh, with Concerned Veterans for America and what we're up to here today. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, you know, I got involved, first of all, my background in special operations, uh, United States Navy. I spent a lot of time overseas fighting for this great, the greatest country in the world. And when Cue I in on that. Special operations, the United States Navy doesn't do it completely justice what this man has done. But, but he speaks in code words sometimes. But he's been in a lot of places he can't talk about doing things on behalf of the American people that need to be done. So I had to give that plug for you, Jason. I've been, I've been blessed. I've been fortunate. I got to serve in this country under the flag of the United States of America. And one of the things that is so important to me is when I got out of my service, that we didn't leave it over there in the sands of Iraq or in Northeast Africa or in Afghanistan. Service in the community here in America is the most important thing. So when I talk, talk, talked about transition, I meant it for myself, but I meant it for others too. Transition to me is how do we plug into the Republic and how do we do the great work that we did over there with duty, with honor, with piety, and do it here in America. So when I ran into you, Pete, and I saw the mission you were doing, getting veterans coalesced behind a cause, advocating for smart policy, holding our elected officials responsible, that meant a lot to me. You guys are action, men of Men of words don't cut it here, and we know that from the battlefield. So you demonstrate the kind of leadership. The Concerned Veterans for America demonstrates that kind of leadership. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, it, you're right. It's about action. We all talked about things, and there's difficulty. We see it. We throw things at the TV, and we're frustrated with the direction of the nation. Ultimately, though, you got to pull up your bootstraps and do something. Tell me, tell me about what's the most difficult thing for service members transitioning? Uh, what, what is it that when you leave the military uh, and the lights are off in your home, what is the most difficult part of that transition process and what should we be doing to address that? That's a, such a great question. I get it a lot. There's a couple things. Number one is guys that are transitioning, they lose that brotherhood we grew up with. You know the camaraderie we share in the battlefield, the camaraderie that's forged in uh, basic training, and the brotherhood that we took overseas. So once you take that away, uh, guys are looking around. Who do they share with? Where do they reach out for their peers? So that's number one. Number two, transition now is also difficult because uh, we look at the foreign policy, we look at a lack of leadership, and men have spent time, blood, and tears on the battlefield. Field. They have paid the price for the liberties and the freedoms, and now they're coming back, and they don't know. They're being asked the question, was your service valuable? And the answer, Pete, is absolutely it was valuable. If you served with honor, if you wore that uniform and you did it with dignity, your service was valuable. Boy, that's right. What a great message. It's a sense of purpose is what I've felt so often is that when you come back, you've been invested in something so, yeah. so much bigger than yourself. Uh, you mentioned the legacy of the wars that we're fighting. Uh, obviously, right now, there's some real difficult news coming out of places like Ramadi. Uh, you know, there was progress, it seems, in Tikrit, but only alongside Iranians and others that helped. What are you hearing from friends and others still in the special operations community, many of which are training or working with folks over there? What's the sentiment right now of, of what, what's happening on the ground in Iraq and, and how, it's, how it's being viewed by those who gave so much to fight for it in the first place? Well, the great news is, number one, our service members are uh, they are stoic and uh, and they are there to serve. They're there to serve with honor. So you can take the policy aside. A lot of our peers and our veterans, um, they're not battle fatigued. They're not weary. They do want leadership and they're thirsting for leadership. No surprise. So are our allies in the Middle East or the Gulf state allies. Everyone's looking for leadership. So my peers that are out there are willing to take this fight to the enemy every single day. But we demand to have a, a clear policy, number one. We want our plans uh, resourced by Congress and backed by the people. This should be, we should be leading from the front, not from behind. When you hear those words, it's, uh, you know, it's something. What's the effect, what's the effect that has on guys? Because, uh, you, you know, we've both served at different times with a lot of contention over conflicts, right? Popular, unpopular wars. You know guys do their job no matter what, but what is statements like that uh, how do they affect the mindset? Do they affect the mindset of guys out there actually pulling triggers? Yeah, absolutely. Well, when you asked about transition earlier, that's the result. When guys hear that overseas, they're going to fight. They're going to do their job. But when they come home and hang up that uniform, they get back here and they're wondering what 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 was that for? When they hear people, um, you know, talking about leading from behind, that kicks morale. What it does is it it, it reduces our rate of um, guys that are enlisting and re-enlisting. They're not going back for second and third and fourth tours because they 
they feel almost like, well, if we're lost, if our national strategy is lost, if the president doesn't back it, then why am I going to back it? So this has become sort of for us, um, you know, it's almost a kick in the gut. Once you once you spend time overseas fighting for this country, you don't want to hear that. You want to hear men that are ready to lead us. Boy, that's right. So what do you think it is that, that we've got a lot of men and women on, on the right and the left, Democrats and Republicans vying to be the next commander in chief? What do you what do they what do you think what are the veterans and the folks that you've served, what do they want to hear from regardless of, of, of party, what are they looking for from a next commander in chief, someone that is gonna lead that military? What's the message you think they want to be hearing at this moment in time? Number one, you better believe in America, because that's why we're serving. And if you don't proclaim the greatness and the glory and the blessings of freedom and liberty and democracy, then you don't deserve to lead this country. Number two, they want a leader who is gonna stay you know, say exactly what he means and lead from the front. We are no longer satisfied with ceding our leadership to others. We need to get back in the driver's seat and we can we our policy can change, we can do something different, but we have to do it deliberately.